All right. Hi, everybody. We're going to give about 30 seconds for all of our participants to join the webinar. I'm watching these attendee numbers go up. This is really exciting. We're so glad you guys are all here. Awesome, awesome. Participant numbers are still going up. All right. Wow, look at all those participants. Okay, I I think we've reached critical mass, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the Winter Oyster Webinar Series presented by Oyster Recovery Partnership and Mom's Organic Market. Tonight, we'll be learning about oyster reef ecology, meaning we're going to get an idea of what it's like to be an oyster. Uh, we'll cover their life cycle, um, the unique ecosystem services that they provide. We'll uh, learn more about how ORP studies oysters as well as the threats that oysters face. My name is Allison Albert Gersio, and I will be your host this evening. I am the marketing manager with Oyster Recovery Partnership, and I'm so excited to be with you guys tonight. Um, ORP is the nonprofit expert in Chesapeake Bay oyster restoration. We're rebuilding the bay's native oyster population by building sanctuary reefs, rebuilding public fishery reefs, supporting the aquaculture or oyster farming industry, recycling oyster shells, and of course, getting the public involved through hands on volunteering and events. Since our founding in 1994, and with the help of major partners like the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science Horn Point Laboratory, ORP has planted more than 9 billion oysters on 3,000 acres of reef and recycled more than 250,000 bushels of oyster shell. That sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. <laughs> And there's still a lot more work to be done. And that's part of the reason that we're here tonight sharing more information with you about oysters. Um, so first, before I introduce our speakers, um, I want to do a few webinar housekeeping items. Um, so we are offering live captioning for this event, and you can turn it on by selecting the closed caption icon in the webinar controls at the bottom of your screen. Um, this broadcast is being recorded and we will post that recording to our YouTube channel when the event is over. Participants, your lines are muted and your cameras are turned off. So if you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A feature in the control panel at the bottom of your screen and our panelists will stick around at the end of the webinar to answer as many as they possibly can. So. Now it's time to re to meet the real talent this evening, and that is our panelists. So I'm going to start by bringing Olivia Caruti on screen. Olivia is our Coastal Restoration Program Manager. Olivia, are you there? I'm here. I got to get my video working. There we go. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm excited to contribute to this great webinar series. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Next, we have Sarah Coleman, and Sarah is a coastal resource scientist here at ORP. Hey, Hi. Sarah. Thanks for joining, everybody. Awesome. Thank you for joining. And last but not least, we have Nicole Schroyer. Nicole is the communications coordinator with Mom's Organic Market. Hey, hey Nicole. Everyone. Hey. Hey. Thanks for being such a great partner to ORP. 
Um, I'm going to let you have the floor so you can share more about moms and why oysters are so important to you. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I'm Nicole. I'm the communications coordinator at Moms Organic Market, and I'm really excited to be here today for the first webinar in the Moms ORP webinar series. Um, you might know this, but our purpose at Moms is to protect and restore the environment, which is why we've actually been partners with ORP since way back in 2014. <laughs> um, ORP has hosted field trips for us. Um, they've received 5% of our sales at our stores during our 5% donation days. And they even helped us start our own oyster farm off of Fleets Island, Virginia in 2015. Most recently in 2020, we began partnering with True Chesapeake Oyster Company to offer sustainable oysters to our customers. And as you may know, oyster shells are the best material to raise new oysters on and to restore oyster reefs. And so to save this ecologically important byproduct from ending up in landfills, we began partnering with ORP to offer oyster shell recycling in all of our stores. And we're really proud of our efforts to grow awareness around the importance of recycling oyster shells. We get questions in stores all the time about why we're collecting shells and <laughs> It's really, it's a great opportunity for us to engage with our community and hopefully teach them something about oysters. Um, in 2019, we collected, or, or sorry, uh, since 2019, we've collected over 16,000 shells in our stores. And in 2020, we collected 2,225 shells, which is actually enough to provide a home to over 22,000 spat or baby oysters to grow. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Allison and she's, I believe she's going to be getting you ready for a poll. That's right. Thank you, Nicole. Before we dive into that poll, I just wanna say that it's truly because of strong partners like moms that ORP can do what it does. And everyone who's attending tonight can help too. And I just wanna share a few ideas about how before we dive into this poll. So obviously we're a nonprofit and uh, we hope you'll consider making a donation to support our work. These donations are really impactful because every dollar you contribute helps us plant 100 oysters. And 95% uh, of the funding that ORP receives um, is used directly for oyster restoration programs. So your money is well spent here at ORP. Um, also, you can shop to support ORP, and that includes purchasing everything from t-shirts to hats to shucking knives to coffee to hot sauce to books and art and adult beverages. We've got something for everyone, so I hope you'll visit the Shop to Support page on our website to learn more. Um, of course, we're all doing a lot of Amazon uh, platform shopping these days. Well, maybe, maybe not all of us, but some of us. Anyway, um, you can designate us as your Amazon Smile charity, and we'll get passive income from any shopping that you do on that platform. So that's a great, easy way to support us. And then, of course, most importantly, we really hope that you'll buy local seafood and that you will eat oysters and you will make sure that those shells are recycled. Oyster shell is a mission critical and increasingly limited resource for us. That's why we established the Shell Recycling Alliance. The Alliance collects oyster shells from a network of restaurants throughout Maryland, DC, Virginia, and even Pittsburgh. And we really hope that you'll patronize those Bay friendly businesses and tell them that ORP sent you. So, now we are ready to kick things off with that poll that we mentioned earlier. So we wanna see how much you already know about oysters and you should see a little poll window pop up shortly. Okay, so this question is specifically about oysters life cycle and it, it's when does a baby oyster become known as a spat? So your answer options are when it grows a shell, when it attaches to something, when it's about one inch long, or when it can swim freely. So go ahead and answer that poll. We got a lot of people on this webinar. So while you're considering your answer, I want to be sure that you've got uh, the information that we've got a really awesome prize package for one of you to walk away with at the end of this evening. 
And that consists of a $50 gift card from Mom's Organic Market and a hat or a t-shirt of your choice from ORP's online merch store. So I'll be announcing that randomly selected winner at the end of the presentation before we do Q&A. I hope you'll stick around. You must be present to win. Um, okay, so let's look at these poll results. And what did people think? Oh, amazing. So it, it looks like uh, the correct answer was B. Um, an oyster is known as a spat when it is attached to something. So we've got a pretty smart bunch here. I'm proud of you guys. Hopefully our first presenter, Sarah Coleman, can still teach you a few things. Um, so without further ado, I would like to uh, end this poll, show us the results. Oops, I feel like I skipped a step. Go ahead and share those results. Sorry about that. Fantastic, okay. So without further ado, let's bring Sarah on screen. Sarah, are you ready? I am, can you see me? I can. Great, I'll let you take it away. Great, thanks Allison. So as Allison mentioned, I'm a coastal resource scientist with ORP. I mostly handle the oyster restoration and monitoring programs here. Um, so we can go ahead and advance the slides, Kaylee. Great. So oysters are bivalve invertebrates with a complex life cycle. Bivalve means that they have two valves or shells, making them closely related to clams and mussels. If we start with this figure here in the lower left corner, you can see adult oysters beginning to spawn. Oysters are sessile, meaning they can't move around and look for a mate. So they broadcast spawn by just releasing millions and millions of eggs and larvae directly into the water column. In Maryland, this spawning typically takes place between June and September and it's triggered by environmental cues. So oysters are looking for water temperature in the range of 20 to 30 degrees Celsius and salinity above 10 parts per thousand. Once those larvae, <clears throat> sorry, once those sperm and eggs are released, they will meet creating a fertilized egg, which then divides to become larva. Larvae then transform from a trochophore to a villager to a petty villager stage. That's what we see at the end of the blue arrow with a well-developed foot. When the pedivelager larvae sink to the bottom, they can use that foot to crawl around and look for suitable substrate. And when they find a hard substrate, preferably another oyster shell, they secrete a glue to attach. They can, um, <clears throat> excuse me, oysters grow typically one inch per year. Uh, depending on conditions, this might be slower if salinity is low. They are considered juvenile at one year of age and adults around three years. In Maryland, the market size legal oyster is three inches. And so when oysters become adults and it's time for them to spawn, the cycle begins again. And one fun fact is that oysters can actually change sex uh, between spawning seasons. So they often start as male and transition to female as they get older. So oysters provide a lot of really important ecosystem services that we're gonna talk about tonight. They are filter feeders, habitat creators, and obviously food. So you've probably heard that oysters are filter feeders. This means that they eat by pumping seawater over their gills and trapping particles like algae. This removes nutrients and can improve water clarity. Some of the nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus that oysters take up from what they eat is assimilated into their shells and tissues. And some of it ends up on the seafloor as biodeposits. Removing excess nutrients is really important because it uh, can prevent harmful things like algal blooms or dead zones in the bay. It's thought that a healthy adult oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day. So if we scale that up to an acre of oyster reef, that's about 36 Olympic sized swimming pools of water per day. So we have a short video to demonstrate that for you. If it loads, <laughs> yay. All right, so here are time lapse. We can see that the tank on the right stays cloudy, but the tank on the left with oysters in it, gets clearer and clearer over time as they filter out suspended sediments and particles in the water. So another really important thing that oysters do is to provide habitat. 
eastern oysters form reefs uh, across the Atlantic coast from the Gulf of St. Lawrence down to the Gulf of Mexico. As oysters settle and grow on top of one, one another, they create a complex 3D structure. And this habitat isn't only good for other oysters, but lots of species, including juvenile fishes, crabs, and other invertebrates like shrimp, barnacles, and amphipods that can use all of these small nooks and crannies to forage and hide from predators. So looking at this slide, uh, we see a blue crab in the upper left corner that we, oh, sorry. <laughs> Come back. Um, so I was just gonna point out on this slide, we have a blue crab uh, that we caught in one of our monitoring surveys. In the upper right is a black cheek tonguefish that we found in the Minokan River. And on the bottom is a healthy, healthy, happy oyster reef um, that's got all kinds of other animals colonizing it, such as bryozoans, algae, and barnacles. So in addition to all of those small animals that might colonize an oyster reef, um, larger animals are also attracted to the structure and the opportunity to feed. So on this slide in the top left, we have a white perch, which is one of the most abundant fish species in the bay, um, typically can live nine to 10 years. Moving clockwise, we have a large mud crab. Um, so they can feed on oysters and other invertebrates. Below that is a sheep's head. They can be found from Nova Scotia to Brazil and grow up to 30 inches in length. And then of course we have a striped bass, which is Maryland's official state fish and one of the most popular commercial and recreational species in the bay. So of course, oysters also provide food. Many different species feed on oysters at different life stages. So when they're larvae that are just floating and swimming through the water column, they might be consumed by anemones, sea nettles, and other filter feeders. Once they transform into spat, they are preyed upon by flatworms and mud crabs. Blue crabs and other fishes might feed on juvenile or larger oysters. Shorebirds can eat oysters in inner tidal areas when they're exposed. And of course, people eat oysters. In this region, there's actually evidence that Native Americans were harvesting oysters as early as 2500 BC, and oysters were cultivated in Japan as early as 2000 BC. The number of oyster harvesters in Maryland has been growing in recent years. And a really cool thing about oysters is that based on where they are grown and what species of algae they are feeding on, it can impact their flavor. Oysters are also great because they're low in calories, but high in protein, zinc, iron and vitamin B12, um, but they're likely not an aphrodisiac, that's a myth. So on this slide, we have in the upper left an oyster toadfish, which is a pretty gnarly looking species that can grow up to 12 inches in length and is often found on oyster reef habitat. In the upper right are some raw oysters from King Street Oyster Bar. And below that is a photo of aquaculture floats. This is a type of gear that farmers use to grow shellfish. And aquaculture has also been increasing recently in this area. Um, and in fact, most of the oysters that you find in restaurants are farm raised. So at this point, um, hopefully our slides can advance and I'm gonna hand the webinar off to Olivia, but I'll be around at the end uh, for any questions. Um, okay, so as Sarah mentioned, um, you know, oysters have, a, have been fished in the Chesapeake Bay region for a very long time. Um, and this is still ongoing. Uh, so as early as the 1600s, um, colonial settlers began harvesting using more modern gear types that we still see today. Um, and oyster, uh, when John Smith first came to the Chesapeake Bay, there are accounts of oyster reefs being so large that they posed severe navigational hazards and could totally destroy a ship that was coming up the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but oysters were plentiful and they were an easy food source to acquire and anybody could do that. Um, and so this is really a long-standing tradition in this region from uh, several thousand years ago to now. Um, but oysters are so desirable that there was actually a massive decline in catches in oysters in the mid-1800s, which led to the Oyster Wars, which are basically famous battles that took place amongst pirates, fishermen, um, and other people of, of the community in the Chesapeake Bay uh, in the mid-1800s to 1900s. Um, and so I just wanted to point out that there's a great chronicle of the Oyster Wars of the Chesapeake Bay by John Wernerson, and that's a book that you can find if you're interested in learning more about. Um, and so ORP, at ORP, one of our missions is to understand the health of oysters in the Chesapeake Bay um, and to help restore, conserve, and inform management of this valuable resource. Um, so one way to do this is by partnering with commercial watermen. Uh, we actually go out on the boat with them and use their commercial gear types to 
sample oysters. Um, and so the image on the far left is one of our partners um, and he's using a patent tong, which is a very common gear type for the fishery here in Maryland. Um, and it's essentially a metal claw that is released with hydraulics to the sea floor, closes and brings up oysters from, uh, from the bottom. We also use scuba divers to do visual surveys on reef habitats to get an idea of what's going on underwater that we can't necessarily see. Um, and then when we bring oysters up on the boat, we uh, can sort them and look at them individually to get an idea of their condition and health. Some of the data that we're really interested in collecting when we're studying oysters are things such as density. So how many oysters are occurring in a specific area? Um, we also want to understand the age structure on reefs. So are there spat present? Are there juveniles present? And are there adults present? And is there evidence that those spat when they settle are actually surviving and growing to become adult oysters that can be harvested or that can be protected? Um, and these two things together, density and the age structure, can be used to calculate biomass, which is the net weight of all of the oysters in a specific area. And this is a really important uh, metric that is used for managing the fishery here. We're also interested in working with some of our partners to use a suite of additional approaches to monitoring and studying oysters um, to help complement the uh, other methods that we use. Um, and so as you can imagine, you know, working on the water is difficult and sometimes can be time consuming. And while it's really valuable for us to hold and look at oysters and actually measure them by hand, uh, we can also use a few other approaches to get really quick snapshots of reef health across a vast area. Um, and so one example of this is by using visual surveys through a series of uh, cameras and videos. Um, and so the big image in the center of this is actually an image of an oyster reef that was taken in the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. Um, using the integrated camera frame, which is shown in the top right. And so this is essentially a frame that can be lowered onto the sea floor um, and is outfitted with a set of GoPro cameras where we can take videos and pictures from different angles. Uh, we can also measure other parameters underwater using this frame, such as things like water quality, um, the amount of oxygen in the water, um, and the amount of sediment that's occurring in the water as well. Um, so the two lasers, sorry, that are shown in the large image are uh, used to get an idea of the size of oysters um, in that image. So visual snapshots are, are one way to do this. Go ahead to the next slide, Kaylee. Another way to do this that's fun um, that I've been working on before I came to ORP was using sound as a way to study what's going on underwater. Um, so believe it or not, uh, a lot of organisms make sound both on land, but also underwater. And um, in an underwater environment, specifically organisms are using sound to navigate, to forage, to communicate, and also for reproduction. Um, and so as scientists, we can listen in to the soundscape or the collection of sounds occurring in an underwater habitat get, to get an idea of how many organisms are there and the overall health of the community. Um, and so to do this, we use an underwater microphone, which is uh, pictured in the bottom left image. So this is a hydrophone that was out on a reef for about three months taking recordings for us. Um, and so the way that we can use this and interpret this is, for example, a degraded reef, such as the one pictured on the bottom right, where there's really low oyster densities, there's not a lot of relief, uh, some of the reef is buried, and it doesn't really have the capacity to support um, a diversity of other organisms, uh, the soundscape would sound different than a reef that is healthier, can provide three-dimensional structure for other organisms, and has high oyster density. Um, and I think with our technical difficulties, we are unfortunately going to have to skip playing the sound clips for you, but I think um, we can share this, obviously, when the recordings go live, and we can also send follow-up messages to all of our participants so that you can actually hear what these two different habitat types would sound like. Um, but I can give a very brief summary. So essentially, on a degraded reef, the soundscape would be very quiet. Um, there wouldn't be a lot of different organisms making noises, and you might just hear water moving in the background. But on a healthy reef, um, you would hear 
relatively louder sounds and you would hear a lot more different types of sounds. So multiple fish calling, you could hear invertebrates crunching and making noises. Um, and so I really hope that after this webinar, you can listen to those recordings because it's very fascinating. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So we're interested, like I said before, in understanding the health of oysters in, in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and part of that is also understanding the threats that oysters are currently facing and will face in the future. Um, so oysters are facing threats from you know, natural uh, occurrences and natural processes, but also human induced stressors. Um, and so some natural examples of natural stress and um, threats are things like predation. Uh, so for example, in the image in the top left, there's a little picture of a snail. Uh, this is actually a voracious oyster predator. It is called an oyster drill. And they actually can drill in two shells and they eat the tissue from inside of the oyster. Um, oysters are also facing issues with disease and uh, parasites. Uh, so one example of that is in the top right image, there's an oyster shell with a boring sponge that has completely covered the shell. Uh, so that orange bit is a sponge, which kind of does the same thing as the oyster drill, except it's actually secreting a chemical that dissolves the shell. Um, so oysters can be affected by uh, these types of naturally occurring threats. Um, but oysters are also obviously impacted by human activities. So a major one that we're facing in the Chesapeake Bay is with shoreline development. You have increased sediment that is running off the land and into the water and into our estuaries. And a lot of that sediment, unfortunately, buries oyster reefs and oysters cannot grow fast enough to escape that sediment layer that's covering them. Um, Sarah mentioned uh, dead zones earlier, and that's definitely a reoccurring issue that we have here as nutrients also run off into the water or pollution runs off into the water, um, there are areas where there's low oxygen and oysters can't survive because they can't breathe. Um, and then in the future, uh, something that we're going to be talking about is threats that our oysters may be facing and are facing due to climate change. But we're really excited to be able to talk about um, an issue that you know is is a very hot topic right now, which is climate change, and just understanding what oysters' role is and potentially being a solution to that. And I think with that, um, we're going to have time for questions. So as a reminder, please enter questions into the Q and A feature. Um, and I think Sarah and I will stick around to answer questions. And I think Allison also is going to be pulling the name for the winner of our raffle. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh my gosh. That was awesome. Even though we had technical difficulties, thank you so much for bearing with us. Can I get a silent round of applause for our presenters in the chat? Because that was a lot to deal with. <laughs> I just want to show them some appreciation. Um, thank you, Sarah and Olivia. So uh, before we dive into q and I do want to announce our giveaway winner. And that person is, oh, Lara Longer. Can't see me. Lara Longer, you are our giveaway winner. Congratulations. Um, hopefully you are still here and you see your name on screen. We have your email address because you registered, but if there's a better way to contact you, please shoot us a chat so we know how to get in touch. Um, we definitely wanna get that swag out to you. So congratulations again. All right, now we have some time for Q&A with our panelists. Um, and it looks like we've got a few questions uh, that are great in the in the Q&A. So I wanna start with those first. Um, and do we have Sarah and Olivia on screen with me? Yep, I'm here. Great. Okay, fantastic. So um, I'm just gonna shoot this out there. C can one of you talk about um, oysters, their filter feeders, are they accumulating toxins? What does that mean? Are they safe to eat? What's the nitrogen cycle help? That is a great question. Um, yeah, so oysters can actually accumulate bad things over time. Um, so if you'll notice, I think it was fairly recently in maybe the Patapsco River, there was actually um, an advisory because there had been a sewage leakage and those oysters were not safe to consume. 
but generally oysters are feeding enough that they're going to, you know, rid their bodies of those toxins and those bad things over time. Um, but there are certainly, you know, shellfish closures that can influence which oysters are safe to eat and which are not. Awesome. And then it looks like we've got another question about how long can an oyster live and how big can they get? Like, are they like uh, lobsters and they'll just grow forever? Uh, yeah, essentially they can, they can grow and live for as long as they're left alone. Um, Sarah, do you know how old, there's like a fossil that was found recently of like the oldest oyster ever recorded. I can't remember how old it is off the top of my head. I, it was millions, I want to say. <laughs> Um, but yeah, finding an oyster that's like upwards of 10 years old, um, is that can definitely happen in the field. Yeah, it can happen, but on areas where there's a lot of fishing activity, you obviously won't see those large oysters because they're being taken out and sold at market. All right. Um, it looks like we've also gotten some questions about the aquaculture industry itself. Um, I don't want to spitball questions at you guys that you can't answer though. So if we need to, you know, answer them in a follow-up email, that's totally okay. But can either of you speak to the, the mag, the economic magnitude of the Chesapeake Bay oyster industry and, or how aquaculture is how farmers fared in 2021 versus 2020? Sure. Um, so I think farmers have fared much better in 2021 than they did in 2020. Um, ORP actually partnered with several farmers in Maryland to um, sort of supplement their income. So with the sort of market collapse in 2020 with restaurants closing and people not really being able to buy uh, farm grown oysters, we partnered with the Nature Conservancy to work with oyster growers to actually plant. Um, and by that, I mean, we took oysters from farms and we paid them for those oysters and we actually put them out on rates that we were restoring. Um, so that was a really successful program. It was a small contribution to help, but you know, over the summer as things open back up again, I think that generally um, farmers have done a lot better this year than they did last year. And then, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I was just going to chime in on SOAR. Um, I think we planted something like 400,000 oysters on six different reefs, if, if memory serves. So that's, you know, that's pretty cool. That's a lot of oysters. Yeah. And just to um, tag along with that, Olivia mentioned that the dockside value of oysters in this last, uh, wild oysters in this last season was 10 million. Um, which is definitely great. Uh, I think the, the biggest peak in recent history was around 2013 and the dockside value was $18 million. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Okay, let's see. Um, Olivia, we've got a question from someone about your underwater reef and uh, your studies of underwater reefs using the microphone. And I think they were looking for some clarification about maybe uh, how you, why was the microphone underwater for three months in order to detect a healthy reef? Or can you just give us more explanation about how you executed that study? Sure, yeah. Um, so th this is part of research that I did before I came to ORP, but I just wanted to advocate because I think, you know, like I said, most people don't realize that there's a lot of sound underwater and it's kind of an exciting thing and an engaging thing to talk to people about. Um, so uh, you can put a, a hydrophone underwater for seconds or minutes and you can still get the same information. Part of what we were interested in um, was actually looking at patterns and how they were changing over time as well, which is why our deployment was so long. Um, but, you know, in, in, other, in other studies that I've seen, you know, things can be as short as an hour uh, for a deployment. So it really depends on what your goals are, obviously. Um, and time of year matters too. So in the summer, you're gonna have a lot more activity happening on reefs. When it's this time of year and it's really cold, um, fish migrate offshore and they're not really around. So there's not a lot of activity anyways. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for, for the best, 
way or time to capture what's going on, it would be probably in the summer. I hope that answers your question. Okay, great. I'm just bouncing around here as questions come in. Um, it looks like someone's asking about a raw bar at their wedding. And can we share a list of oyster farms that they could potentially, um, you know, get some some DMV oysters on their raw bar? And the answer to that is absolutely. We have a list of oyster farms on our website and we'll be happy to include that in our follow-up email. So you can, you'll have a whole bunch to pick from. Um, all right, let's see. Our next question is, it looks like there's some follow-up on the um, oyster toxins and uh, oysters filter feeding toxins and the nitrogen cycle. Can you clarify what happens, I guess, at the end? Like where, where does the toxin go when it's excreted or what happens at the end of the cycle? Yeah, um, so I, I saw someone asked, is this just delaying the pollution? Um, so the idea is that oysters are filtering and kind of packaging up those nutrients in a different, less available way. Um, and so they're gonna end up in the sediment where bacteria can come and kind of break them down and they're not gonna be floating around in the water column, um, potentially causing more damage. Yeah, I don't know, Olivia, if you wanna add to that. No, I think that that summarizes it perfectly. Um, if if an oyster is living in an area where there is, you know, constant pollution, like for example, uh, well, you don't really have oysters living in the inner harbor of Baltimore because <laughs> <laughs> the water quality is so poor there, and there's such a long-standing, uh, like industrial operation going on there. So, um, you know, you're not going to have oysters surviving. But if there were oysters that were surviving there, they would just be depositing that right into the sediment. And as Sarah said, in essentially a form that's not really available for other organisms to take up. Great. Um, it looks like we're getting a lot of questions about how people can get involved. Um, we have a number of, you know, volunteer opportunities, especially if you're in the Maryland, you know, portion of the Chesapeake Bay, we have something called the Marylanders Grow Oysters Program, where you can actually, you know, uh, grow oysters in cages from the end of your dock or community pier or, you know, some kind of water access. Those cages do require a little bit of care and feeding for the nine months that you'll be um, raising those juvenile oysters, um, just, you know, a shake once a week to make sure that they're clear from debris and also um, actually still submerged underwater. That's very important or <laughs> those oysters will die. Um, but then those baby oysters are collected and they're planted on reefs in local waterways throughout the Chesapeake Bay. So Marylanders Grow Oysters is a great opportunity for you to get involved um, if you're interested. And then if you don't have access to waterfront property or, you know, a community pier or something, we also run uh, build a reef. They're called build a reef campaigns. Um, there's one happening in the Severn River that's gone on for, I think, three years now. We started in 2018 and um, you can actually donate and those donations go directly to put oysters in the water in the Severn River. So look up buildareef.org if that's something that you're interested in supporting. Um, what else, guys? What am I forgetting? You can eat. You can eat oysters and recycle the shells. <laughs> Absolutely eat oysters and recycle the shells. All right, um, let's, we'll take a couple more questions and then I think we'll wrap up around 720. I know you guys um, have plenty of, plenty more. So if you want to get an answer and we weren't able to address your question, you can email us at info at oyster recovery.org. Um, and let's see, what do we, what else do we have? Um, What happens to oysters when the water temperature drops to freezing or below? Do they go dormant? 
Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. Oysters sort of have this dormant period over the winter when I don't know the exact threshold. I don't know if you know, Sarah, if there's a threshold for when that dormancy period begins. Um, but they they definitely lower their metabolism, um, lower their heart rate, and they kind of just lie there closed for weeks at a time. Um, it, it's pretty fascinating. Oyster, the oyster biology is just very different from, you know, other animals that we think of. Yeah, and mostly in Maryland, we're seeing subtitle oyster reefs. Um, so we don't have, you know, major cold related mortality, but in places where reefs are intertidal, if those oysters are exposed to really cold air temperatures for a prolonged period, that can cause them to die off. Um, Sarah, it looks like we got another question about the oyster, the beginning of an oyster's life cycle and, uh, you know, when they can move on their own versus when they can't. Can you talk a little bit more about that, the beginning of the life cycle and how, I guess, when the foot forms and when oysters are ready to attach and. Yeah. So the larvae stage is only about two to three weeks, um, when oysters are free floating and they do have the ability to swim a little bit, but they're by no means strong swimmers. Um, but once they settle down and secrete that basically liquid cement to attach and become a spat, they can't move after that. So interesting, some clams, um, scallops, for example, can actually swim and move around, but oysters are totally locked in place <laughs> once they become spat and then when they age. And that's life or death for them, right? They have to attach or they don't survive, right? Did I lose you? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, that's, that's correct. <laughs> right, we're both shaking our heads, but I think we have to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most interesting Facebook posts that we, uh, we've created is to ask people to submit pictures of the funny things they've seen oysters attached to. And we've seen everything from light bulbs to sunglasses, to cell phones, to shoes, to, uh, I don't even know, but pieces of like broken pottery. It's, it's really cool. Nature finds a way. <laughs> um, okay. It is about 7.20 and I, I want to wrap things up and just say thank you, thank you, thank you so much to everyone who attended tonight. We really appreciate your support and that you stayed with us through technical difficulties. Um, we, we can't do what we do without your support. And so we really hope that you'll join us for the next webinar, um, February 9th, Oysters and Climate Change. Uh, we'll be sending a follow-up email so that you can uh, Rewatch the, the webinar if you want, as well as share those videos Olivia mentioned and more. So have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you for attending and we'll see you in three weeks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.